The hard round splintered alongside a thousand others on the wall of the capital city defences. The insect taskmaster made jerking, threatening motions, hissing and cracking his lash, spurring Solomon to fire again. He sent a burst of fire from his auto gun that traced across the thundering night in a wide, untrained grouping. A well-muscled soldier opened up with a heavy stubber to Solomon's left, ripping bullets into Rock Creek barricades that sent a light show of crimson ricochets sparking into the sky. The city's defenses called back in furious anger. Huge search beams swept the area like the eyes of giant gods, lighting the path for the haphazard collection of improvised weapon platforms to rain death from their high position. Solomon was close enough to spot Imperial engineers and militiamen running the length of the wall. Hunched from the weight of the stacks of munitions they constantly delivered to the guns. They occasionally dropped like targets at a carnival range when snipers of the arch enemy sent overcharged bolts whistling through them. The muscled heavy gunner turned with a sneer to Solomon and the wretched squad of injured troops that surrounded him and roared for them to advance, finishing his thickly accented order with a burst of fire dangerously close to their feet. With a crippled cheer, the squad stood as tall as their broken bodies could muster, threw out a dark prayer to their god from their cracked, bloody lips, and charged. An aging farmer of root vegetables that had lived his entire life in the mundane safety of Arvum, now raced and rolled from barricade to barricade, Laz and explosive rounds missing him by mere inches. A week ago this would have stunned him in fear, frozen his advance to be cut down by the incoming fire, but this feeling had subsided. Any thoughts of his past happy life had faded into blurred dreams, eaten away by unrelenting visions of horror and survival. Survival. He would survive. A rushing soldier to his flank lost the upper half of his head as a bolt screamed into him, spraying Solomon's iron mask with gore. The view of the battlefield turned oily purple as thick, dripping matter covered his vision. Solomon hurriedly fingered out the eye slits, scooping and flicking handfuls of skull and sticking brains to the ground, wiping his hands clean on his flak armor and a nearby Aquila graffitied barrier. He exhaled a mantra of rapid breaths, tapped his weapons magazine a designated number of times for superstitious fortune, and ready to move onwards. Find the paths and live he promised himself before he moved on his haunches, away from the cover of the Rockcrete barricade and sidling in behind the fresh wave of troopers that sprinted towards the main gate to the city. Quad-mounted machine guns swiveled as they fired from the wall, kicking up huge chunks of the earth around Solomon and the charging warriors. The road leading to the city's giant gate was wide and perilously open. Burning vehicles from both armies lit their charge like beacons. The sprawling bodies of incinerated crewmen and drivers crunching to carcinogenic dust under the heavy zigzagging boots of the assault. Traitor engineers at the front of the advance hastily assembled improvised explosives, passing them to manic infantry that hurled them towards the reinforced gate. Most of the crazed soldiers were cut down before they got to throw the bombs, their bodies disintegrating when the timers expired. Crude, percussive detonations flashed and popped leaving an impressive plume of black smoke, but barely denting the heavy gate to the city. The defenders on the wall boldly made the sign of the Aquila as they mocked and cursed at their attackers with obscene hand gestures. From the concealment of apertures in the wall, Imperial sharpshooters thinned the engineers' ranks with expert shots to the satchel charges before more had a chance to be primed. The colossal searchlights combed the area again, illuminating an entire platoon of Adavan infantry that slowly crept through a wheat field to the east of the wall. They were instantly pinned by ferocious defense fire before vaporizing in well-coordinated mortar strikes. The stones began to jump around Solomon's feet. His bones shook and his teeth chattered to the squealing treads of armored vehicles approaching through the rainstorm, their rattling engines bellowing above the crash of thunder. Each vehicle's own mounted lumen cast an image of a monster's gaze in Solomon's mind. A vision of a creature's cyclopean white eye that pierced the darkness. The metal beasts that pushed through the heavy rain were not birthed from the mythological tales of antiquity, 
but the forge worlds of the Imperium, looted and repurposed by the arch enemy. Riding on the holes of the three golden painted tanks were more of the androgynous demons from the Forest March, their wicked claws gripping onto the metal and bone scaffolding that caged the vehicles. They hadn't finished advancing before each tank opened up with their main cannon, focusing all of their immense firepower on the huge gates. A barrage of snaking missiles responded in kind from the wall, bombarding the tank line and shredding one of the vehicle's treads in a flaming shower of metal plates and side skirting. The tanks continued their punishments of the gates with rapid fire whilst the demonettes dismounted, craving the anticipated taste of combat. Solomon watched the giant gates begin to buckle, great cracks appearing on the reinforced metal as more explosive tipped shells pounded the target. The demonettes screeched as the thick battle cannon smoke cleared and a hole had appeared in the gate. They launched themselves forward at blistering speeds to be the first to reach access to the city. They funneled into the breach in the gate, and Solomon heard frantic exchanges of weapon fire before it gave way to a chorus of human, murderous death cries from beyond. The full force of the scourge of Adavan pressed forward now, eager to turn the capital city into a wasteland of pleasure and unforgiving pain. Pink, flak-armored troops scrambled over one another like excited addicts to gain access to the capital, wildly firing their las guns through the cracked hole in the gate to the tune of the citywide alarms and terrifying thunderclaps above. The heretic invaders must have taken control of the gatehouse as a deafening grind of gears signaled the locks disengaging and the door start to rise. Solomon rose to his feet as the gate reached its summit and felt something building within him. An urge to cry out, not in pain or for his fallen world, but for bloody victory. He had survived the sacking of his village. He had survived seven soul flaying days and nights hidden in the ranks of the arch enemy. He had survived a full frontal assault on a heavily defended bastion of the Imperium. He felt good, powerful, a warrior. With two hands, he held his auto rifle above his head and screamed until his throat bled. The cobblestone streets of the capital were full of the debauchery Solomon had come to expect after such an assault. The wine flowed as freely as the bloodletting on every corner, and he knew it was dangerous to even be near the acts of depravity he suddenly found impossible to look away from. He had frequently wondered how the host even maintained a fighting presence with the frequency with which they killed their own. There were sacrifices, relentless infighting, self-murder, and the constant pursuit of pleasure through nefarious, life-shortening ways. There was beast-baiting, gladiatorial fights, scarification, branding, and amputations of digits, limbs, and genitals. This is what they did to celebrate, to congratulate each other for another world fallen. Solomon stared with a worrying nonchalance as the city's town crier was pulled from his domicile and into the street by a gang of young initiates who kicked and wrestled the man to the ground. The Adavan youths took turns to spit in his mouth before they gouged out his larynx with a dull, peeling blade. Solomon did not even wince as the crier's vocal cords tore and his low, burbling screams became high pig-like squeals. Great field kitchens had been erected in the market district of the city, Roasting trunks of meat turned on giant spits, the skin crackling and oozing rich, sticky juices onto the sizzling coals below. With his stomach empty, Solomon cautiously approached the eatery, and a handful of carved meat was thrust into his palm. It smelled divine, of exotic spices that Solomon had only dreamt about tasting in his lifetime. He hurried like a scavenging rat into an unlit alley, loosened and lifted the iron mask away from his mouth and began to devour the meat with a crazed grin. He licked the lining of warm grease from his thin lips before closing his eyes, savoring each succulent bite and swallow of the tender fatty meal. All that mattered was filling his starving belly, especially when the food tasted this damned good. Solomon didn't even notice the pair of heretic cooks carrying the limp body of an overweight imperial citizen past the alleyway entrance and heaving the corpse onto a field kitchen table. 
The body was stripped, beheaded, quartered, stuffed with spiced vegetables, and rammed onto another spit pole. Solomon emerged fat and happy from the narrow alleyway, tonguing the remaining meat from the many gaps in his teeth. He continued to traverse the winding streets of the ravaged city, thinking nothing of taking a long woolen greatcoat from the smashed window of a tailor and sweeping it around his storm-soaked frame. He reached through the shattered doorway of the next broken storeface and picked a large bottle of hard liquor, paying with an imaginary coin that he flipped to the elderly owners of the shop that lay motionless in each other's arms. Dried bullet holes through their heads and a handgun by the old gentleman's side. The bodies had been left to rot by the arch enemy. No fun if they're not screaming, concluded Solomon as he unscrewed the bottle cap and took a swig of the fermented fruit alcohol through the mouth slit of the mask. It warmed his throat when it didn't spill down the iron facing. He'd missed being able to drink and be merry since government taxations had risen to astronomical heights. Frag your taxes. Worth nothing but shit now, Solomon mused as he took another hefty drink of the soothing brandy. The strong alcohol had started to take effect, a warming glow rising from his stomach that numbed his hands, face, and mind. He had to suppress a drunken giggle when he stopped to watch an Adavan trooper desperately attempt to fornicate with a statue of the city's pompous governor, rutting himself bloody on the granite legs of the enormous effigy. He lifted the amasek and took another mouthful, immediately spitting it out with an uncontainable laugh. It all seemed ridiculous, like some elaborate joke. The copulating man looked over and gestured with his head for Solomon to join in, flicking out his dry, milky tongue in quick, disgusting motions. Solomon doubled over, his laugh now turning into a mirth-filled howl. The thrusting soldier started to laugh too. They laughed together, until the soldier finished consummating with his stone lover and moved on to the next statue of the governor's prized horse. The world was spinning now in vomit-inducing angles and colours. The smell of death in the air and strong alcohol on his breath. The sounds of monsters and the wails of civilian agony echoing through the streets. The ground seemed to tilt suddenly through his intoxicated eyes like a rocking boat heaving on unsteady waters. Failing to right himself, he tumbled over a slack cobblestone and landed hard on the wet thoroughfare, shattering some of the bones in his fingers, as well as his prized bottle that littered the road in thick shards of glass. He pulled his knees to his chest and wept like a baby who had broken his favourite toy, mourning the fermented anaesthesia that washed away in the rain. Solomon's damp eyes began to lag behind the cherubic mask and he allowed himself to forget the madness, the darkness of sleep closing in around him. A sweet, smelling smoke enveloped Solomon as he returned to the Temple of Flesh within his dreams. Along the walls of the great pulsating main chamber were bronzed ornate doors, their sizes varying from dwarven to giant. They opened in turn as he passed, allowing him brief diverging scenes of pleasure and endless greed. In one crowded side chamber, hairless, identical women lounged on a bed of living meat, pleading for Solomon to join them, their supple, Nubian skin being branded in the vile, searing symbols of chaos by a hooded tormentor. In the corner of the chamber, a corpse of one of the sisters was strung up by her veins, the long threads of arterial tubes wrapping around a plinth of marbled stone. Red, circular eyes like polished rubies fixed on Solomon from inside the executioner hood as he teetered at the doorway. A perverted, voyeuristic compulsion to step inside, arguing with his rational thoughts. The hooded figure angrily yammered in a deep foreign tongue before unseen hands slammed the door shut and it moulded into the wall of flesh. From the neighbouring doorway, a golden flowing stream of coins and precious jewels ran into the main chamber. He reached down and inspected a handful of the gold pieces, palming through each shining treasure. Confusion spread across Solomon's features, as in the light of the fire pits he found all of the coins were embossed with his own dishevelled face on one side. 
and on the other, Adamina. The beautiful face of the woman he had helped nurse through years of pain and labors. The companion he had loved deeply since their time growing up on the farm as children. The kind and selfless Adamina, who had honored and shared the sacred vows of marriage for thirty wonderful years. The bawling, helpless invalid he left to die as he cowered under rotten floorboards. Nearly forgotten in a week, if it hadn't been for the coins that fell through Solomon's open fingers, he was sure he would have forgotten his wife forever. Then he heard her. The voice was soft and quiet, barely audible over the crackling torches, muffled lustful moans, and cast iron fire pits. But it was there, calling out to him from beyond the single wooden door in the lavish row of gateways that lined the breathing walls. He approached the unremarkable door and pressed an ear against the bare wood. Her voice called to him again with a muted whimper. Something clicked, and the door opened with a backdraft of blinding smoke. Solomon stepped within. A swirling mist danced in front of his steps, guiding him through a corridor of mirrors that distorted his reflection whenever he dared to look. In one tall looking glass, his body appeared crippled and lame his face hanging loose on one side, threatening to fall from his skull. In the next mirror, wide and devastated white wings fluttered behind him, cancerous bleeding feathers molting from his back. In some of the reflected images, other fantastical creatures and leering figures walked alongside Solomon, acting as guides, temptresses, or curious spectators. The tripping smoke that pulled at him and masked the way forward now began to wisp away on the current of an invisible wind, revealing the end of the narrowing corridor and a polished mirror that spanned the height of the room. A disembodied push from behind thrust Solomon against the glass pane and held his head towards the materializing images that played out in the dream beyond the glass. It was their home on the farm during the night of the first attack. A statuesque crowd of armored soldiers stood gathered in the candlelight, their motionless backs to Solomon he attempted to see what was beyond the gathering, standing on the tips of his toes and calling out furiously for the invaders to move. Adamina's voice crowed once more, this time clear and painfully close. The unseen hold on Solomon's head pushed him further against the glass. It felt like his body was drowning in warm sink mud as he was forced from one reality into another. He now stood in the living quarters of his home behind the gathering of soldiers who refused to respond to Solomon's arrival. He took a deep inhale of breath and could smell the familiar farmyard aromas entering the hab through the splintered door. With their backs still to him, the marauders parted in disturbing synchronization, stepping outwards to the sides of the room in three regimented lines. They came to a uniform stop frozen in a formation that gave them the unnatural appearance of market mannequins in preparation for transit. The faceless, smooth heads on top of the soldiers' bodies more than helped with this illusion. His Adamina sat on the floor by the fireplace. Her face and body looked young and full. Dark hair brushed against her neck in the side plait he always favoured when they first caught it. Solomon approached and slowly knelt to sit on his heels in front of his wife. She would not look or respond to him however much he called her name or begged for forgiveness. She just stared with soulless apathy, through his gaze and into the void. He beat the ground until his knuckles split. He wrapped a hand around her face and tried to force her to talk, shaking her head with a new violence bubbling inside him. A clamorous sound took his attention as a familiar bill-hooked machete clattered to the ground by his side. The mannequin soldiers hadn't moved as he looked back and scoured the room, their perfect line still unbroken. Before he could turn his head back to Adamina, she was upon him. With a demonic ferocity, she scratched and bit at Solomon's exposed skin, sinking needled teeth into his screaming face. In panic, he gripped onto her head to prevent her pulling back and tearing his cheek away. Midnight black eyes vibrated and bulged inside their sockets as her young, unblemished skin became translucent and withered in metamorphic transformation. They wrestled around the living quarters of the farmstead, crashing into the mannequin troopers who fell like rigid pins from the impact. 
He thrust a punch upwards into her throat, and the demon released her locked jaws from his face. Solomon rammed his forehead into her nose, smashing the cartilage to powder. She winced and recoiled in shock, giving him the second he needed to scramble for the blade and cleave it deep into her collarbone. Bright crimson blood fountained from the cut as the demon fell, the body going into grand mal seizure in a frothing pathetic heap. The horrific features of the black-eyed creature dissolved, and once more his wife lay crippled and bleeding, mouthing silent words of betrayal, confusion and prayer as she stared at him in terror. The mannequin surrounded the panting Solomon, and he watched with dead eyes as they tore her apart. He woke to the sound and acrid smell of the initiate gang urinating on him. One of the youngest members, a child no more than twelve, was trying to cut through the canvas sling on Solomon's shoulder and take the auto gun from his back. Another filthy-handed teen rifled through his bandolier and greatcoat pockets. The leader announced to the group he wanted the eyes, brandishing the short blade still sticky from the crier's murder. They hadn't realized he was awake when they attempted to take off the iron mask. In a sobering haze, he pulled up his weapon, and with a deafening burst, the gang dropped dead. A short applause rippled from a squad of Adavan infantry nearby before they turned back to their conversation and the murder was forgotten. He charged another magazine into the smoking rifle and warily stood, the dizzying effects of the Amasek still present in his blood. In the overcast grey clouds of dawn, the invaders held a celebratory parade in the main square of the capital. The vibrant, garish colours of the soldiers' uniforms and the stalking monsters lent the once dull palette of the architectural stonework a sense of pageantry and life. It was unhinged at all times. Their maniacal whims and strategy would never be organised into a true fighting force, but Solomon had to admit that they at least enjoyed their short, brutal lives. He stood quickly back onto the pavement as one of the golden tanks thundered past. The child gunner aimed the mounted heavy bolter at the crowd of cultists and infantry and mimicked the rattle of his weapon with wet farting noises from his mouth. The gathering cheered and laughed to the sight of the child howling at the sky to the melody of the tank's monstrous war horn. Drunk on alcohol, pleasure and victory, the audience spilled from the pavements and side streets following behind the treads of the behemoth, their sudden surge of movement forcing Solomon along in a claustrophobic wave of stinking heretics. He couldn't find his breath as bodies crashed and squeezed against him. The smell was nauseating within the crush, like an overflowing latrine doused in weak old sweat and left to cook in the sweltering heat of a summer's sun. Solomon was thrust forward, his hands grasping onto any extremities to stop from falling and being trampled to death. There were brief lulls in the movement, and he took these chances to try and escape. With his arms up to his chest, he pushed through slim pockets in the mob, taking a couple of quick steps before another wave surge hit, sending him spinning in a new direction. Solomon had battled the periphery by the time the crowd had converged at the steps of a vast imperial cathedral. Upon the corners of the ancient building perched a pair of mighty statues, their stone raptorial talons hooked over palatial columns, colossal wings splayed high and wide as if about to take flight. Solomon watched a tank rotate its turret and send a well-placed anti-armor shell that impacted on one of the stonework eagles, taking one of its heads off in a burst of dust and debris. Giant chunks of falling stone tumbled down the cathedral steps, an unlucky group of soldiers flattened to paste under its rolling path. He felt a rising warmth when the red sun of Arvum cut through the cloud cover and lit the cathedral like theatre lanterns. As if planned by the dark gods themselves, the focus point of the star's light shone across the arched entrance of the building, drawing the entire crowd's attention. It may have been the brandy in his veins, or something darker, but Solomon felt drawn to the spectacle. He clambered to the front of the audience, fighting off unrelenting, fondling touches that expended the remainder of his lilting energy. 
Anticipation rose to fevered heights when a mighty fanfare of horns and vox amplified ululation welcomed the main protagonist to the stage of despair. The scourge of Adavan cried out as one, weeping in sheer admiration for the warp spawned greater demon that crawled from the archway. Its steps were stalked by a procession of beast riding maidens that pulled at their bipedal mounts, fanning out across the length of the wide steps. The four armed demon uncoiled to its full height and looked upon its army, relishing the pain they had wrought on this mortal world. It unfurled its scything arms and rumbled a call that drowned out all other sounds. There was something else that shared the stage with the devil. A small naked figure, almost invisible in the titanic shadow of the demon's legs, came forward. A woman. Solomon vomited inside his mask. Adamina. It was truly her, not the hell-born apparition that plagued his dreams each time he slumbered. His wife began to run her fingers over the scaled leg of the demon to the hissing dismay of the mounted maidens, their claws clacking in protest. Their wicked steeds shared in their distress, kicking out with avian feet and lashing at Adamina with vicious spiked tails. The Keeper of Secrets paid no attention to the descent of its heralds, and nor did Adamina while she continued to caress and kiss its glistening skin. Solomon felt the emptiness of a lover's betrayal, squirming as he watched his wife find pleasure at the touch of the monster. A writhing sensation churned his gut that made him seethe with anger and jealousy. She made carnal sounds of love and lust he'd never once heard from her lips. The crowd erupted in exhilaration and Solomon was caught in the surge again when a band of cultists battled their way to the front to worship at the feet of the demon and its new queen. A wash of engine noise above. Solomon hadn't realized the arch enemy had flyers trying to pinpoint the craft's approach. He wondered how they even had pilots that wouldn't dive-bomb their crafts into the earth just to feel the rush of the ground race towards them. Something loud and astoundingly fast ripped over the cathedral with a boom, a flash of blue engine flame in its wake. Then another. Two more. The fighter wing pitched upwards into the sky before turning in formation and diving towards the assembly with the burning sun at their backs. It was only when the tank's gunners opened up with furious ground-to-air defense did Solomon realize that this was not air fleet of the Chaos host. Heavy bolter shells tore upwards into the sky in snaking lines of glowing tracer fire, catching one of the wings of the diving craft that corkscrewed and exploded through the square in a rolling fireball. An Imperial Thunderbolt leveled out and loosed a salvo of multi-laser shots and autocannon shells into the grounded army. Lines of unprepared troops and cultists toppled and came apart. One of the gilded tanks went up in a blinding mushroom cloud, the kill belonging to the air fighter that banked hard through the swirling smoke of the explosion. Solomon leapt to the ground and hauled a dying cultist on top of him as another jet screamed overhead, releasing a canister from its fuselage that broke apart ejecting hundreds of submunitions, the flowering bomblets twisted like darts to the ground, detonating across the swarm of trapped infantry in small fragmenting blasts. Solomon roared through gritted teeth, frantically tucking his body into the back of the dying heretic as shrapnel and steel bearings indiscriminately maimed and slaughtered all around him. Two more lines in the crowd were chewed to mulch when a thunderbolt swooped down in an attack run its wing-mounted guns emptying into the heaving crush of bodies. Adavan troopers manned the quad guns they had salvaged from the walls of the city, trying to knock the fighter craft out of the sky, but the Imperial pilots were already thundering their way out of the battle to rearm and refuel. Solomon kicked off the heavy, lifeless cultist and looked at the cathedral steps. The beast-riding demonettes were gone, their steeds bolting from the chaos of the air assault, the greater demon had scaled the side of the enormous building, screaming at the aircraft that were now distant pinpricks in the sky. Adamina was alone. Solomon had never been a brave man, yet as he made his way up the high stone steps he felt no fear, 
only the desire to rescue his Adamina and break her free of the demon spell. He removed his body armor and cast away the iron mask to show a smiling, filthy face. His eyes were bloodshot and dark, yet full of atonement and love. Tears that were born from shame welled and blurred his vision before falling down his emaciated cheeks. A shrill, painful screech spun Solomon around, the disgusting, oozing insect beast that had tortured and goaded him for seven days of hell launched itself up the steps after him. It was repulsively quick as it wormed its way upwards. Its piercing battle cries turned to gurgling nonsense as a hard slug round ripped half its face off. Long, centipede legs sprawled and slipped on their own pus-yellow icor as Solomon pumped another bullet into its bloated thorax. The next shot sheared off the lashing arm that spun away and left a gaping ragged hole running thick discharge onto the stonework. Solomon did not stop firing until his weapon clicked dry. Solomon swallowed hard when he realized the commotion on the steps had garnered the attention of a band of cultists that skulked their way towards him holding long blades. He fumbled a fresh charge of bullets into his auto rifle, just in time to defend himself and Adamina. The gun bucked in full auto. The recoil too unruly for Solomon to hold steady, sending more rounds wide than on target. Before he had a chance to control the weapon, it had emptied. He reached into his leather bandolier. No more ammunition. He wildly swung the weapon like a club, cracking the jaw of a closing cultist that sent him reeling down the steps, spitting teeth. More hooded thrills swarmed, ascending the broad cathedral steps. He turned and rushed to Adamina, holding her close as the voices of the vile heretics drew closer. He needed to shield her from their blades, sacrifice himself and be free from the dreams of torment and cowardice. Solomon tensed as he prepared to feel the gutting knives dig inside his back and puncture his organs. He was not afraid. The world around him erupted in noise and phosphorescent flame. Solomon closed his eyes and accepted with a relieved laugh that this was the end, that his mortal body had been destroyed and he was being taken to stand in the Emperor's light. But agonizing screams of death were never mentioned in the prayer texts. Solomon opened his eyes and turned to see the steps behind burning with a brilliant white fire. The flames stuck and melted the attacking cultists' flesh and bones to blubbery jelly that ran down the steps like upturned canisters of Prometheum. Anti-aircraft weapons and small arms belched at the fighter bomber that strafed the city's market district with more of the white flame. Solomon turned back to his beautiful wife and gently brought her face close to his. He kissed her, begging for absolution whilst another explosion of white fire sparked across the cathedral roof, the greater demon disappearing in the blast. He held her tight into his chest and felt a brief movement in their clutch, like the involuntary spasms of lamentation. He raised a loving hand to wipe away her tears but recoiled when he saw she was smiling with a mouth that split her cheeks from ear to ear. Her naked skin seemed to stretch and ripple as if something wanted to climb its way out, and her beautiful eyes turned black and pitted like egg sacs. The dread host of Adavan had used her broken body as a vessel for the monster that now resided inside her hollowed shell. Adamina's pain and suffering from the cancerous disease would have fed the demon fat. A full squadron of fighter bombers now approached from the east, leaving a vast, mile-wide contrail across the cloudless sky. They descended and started their fire raid on the outskirts of the city. The world burned. Solomon grabbed onto the creature that was once his wife and wrapped his arms around her tightly before she could escape. She bit into his throat and tore his belly open. She spat corrosive gobbets of phlegm into his eyes which melted in their sockets. He just held her tighter. In his blindness, Solomon could hear the aircraft fly past the spiraling whistle of their bombs falling. The last thing he felt was a transient moment of unspeakable agony as they were doused in the white fire. Their flaming bodies melded together in a lover's embrace, skin falling away to reveal liquefying bones that in turn puddled at the top of the temple of flesh and stone. Together, 
forever in life and death. <laughs>